I think a really good starting point is kind of introspection and working out like what is it that I uniquely can share that other people can't share. Our guest today is the VP of content at Animals, which is a widely renowned content marketing agency. He's worked with big companies like Google, GoDaddy, probably a hundred more at Animals as well, and has helped strategize content for hundreds of clients. He's also published a published science fiction author of the Rainmaker writing series. So check that out. Not many fiction authors get to come on the podcast, so that's really cool. I know he's going to bring the fire today talking about content organization, content buckets, systems for organizing content. I'm excited to welcome Ryan Law onto the show. Ryan, this is the awkward part of the show where we pretend like we haven't been talking for the past 10 minutes. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing exceptionally well now because you shouted my book series out. So anyone that does that is immediately like the n- nicest and best person in the world. So, yeah, thank you. Looking forward to chatting again. No, I appreciate it. Yeah. So Ryan and I have have worked together a little bit before with with animals, and uh, it's this is going to be a really good session of just boiling down content organization and content buckets and how we can get ourselves thinking about what we should post when, give ourselves some structure. And find out the nuance that exists in there. But let's start a little bit more broad. So we all know that usually with content, with anything really in marketing, you start with your goals first, you work your way back from there, you kind of reverse engineer it from your goals. Um, For you personally, when it pertains to content, how do you personally set goals for content? And maybe give us examples of what a good goal is versus a bad goal. Yeah, good question. So... I've been doing content marketing like a very, very long time. Um, I mean, I know you have as well. Um, and I came very much from this kind of HubSpot world where, you know, content was this amazing thing that could basically do anything. And that was how we sold it to like a bunch of skeptical people. You know, you publish a blog post and you get traffic and you get backlinks and you get brand awareness and you get revenue and all those amazing things. So I think people are aware that content can do lots of things. It can hit all of these amazing goals. But I think the thing I don't see people do enough of that I was very guilty of myself was not being specific enough about the individual goals and the individual types of content you're going to use to do that. Because to some extent, if you publish a good blog post, you'll get a tiny bit of all of those benefits if you're lucky. But if you want to get the best results out of it, you have to be more concrete with the goals you're setting and then more concrete with the type of content to achieve that. So we quite often talk to customers during like our sales process and they will say, you know, yeah, we, we want all of those things from content. They're all good things. Let's do all of them. And then we have to kind of almost think through like a Maslow's hierarchy of content needs to try and distill down like, all right, what is the one thing we really have to start with and hit? What is the one goal that you absolutely need to achieve right now before we can ladder up to some of the like second order and important but not quite as immediately important goals so that's like the probably the first thing to do what is one goal you can come up with the more specific and measurable and attainable the better and then use that as a way of laddering up to like other goals afterwards when you're looking at the people that you've onboarded animals or even like companies you've worked with on the side whatever if you're looking at the average company what do they usually have set up like how how good is their content organization already or is it usually just totally horrendous um we've written about this a few times but um it generally pretty bad because obviously if you're brand new to content and you've never done it before you tend to default to whatever the platform you're using sets up for you so the classic is like the uh, hideous wordpress url structure so yeah, maybe you'll have like the blog and then there'll be like an abstract date subfolder and then buried 10 layers deep within the website, you'll have whatever blog post you're publishing that day. Um, and that kind of comes from this mentality of content being, you know, kind of like a publication, like it's the daily newspaper that you open up and here's the article for the day. But in most cases, that's not the best way of thinking about how you organize it from like a site structure and um, like, yeah, overarching angle because you're thinking more in terms of libraries of content. You People will generally not read all of your content in sequence. They'll find you through like one blog post and you want to make it as easy as possible for them to get to the other related stuff. So yeah, most companies, it's a really, from a URL perspective, it's bad from a kind of thinking about how you approach it 
that's bad as well because if you don't have a system in place for prioritizing goals and working out which content you're going to create first and then afterwards, you can just end up with a whole bunch of pages that don't do much for you. And in some cases, it's even hard to work out whether they're doing anything useful as well. Throughout this interview, I want to try to like solve some of the stuff that you see wrong, some of the mistakes you've pointed out already. I'm sure there are more that we can uncover too. So talking about content buckets, maybe we just start with a clean slate here. I'd love to get your definition of when I'm saying content buckets, can you just say what that actually means to you so that we can start from from zero there? Obviously, there's lots of content you can create. It can be anything. Um, I think a really good starting point for approaching a content strategy is working out which of the handful of core content types you are going to be best served by starting with. Um, and there are loads of them, but like three that we see really common, like three core buckets that we recommend to customers. One of them would be SEO content. One of them would probably be thought leadership content. And another one would be sales enablement. Uh, and they're not like perfect rigid definitions, but they're three really common types of content that serve three really different purposes. Um, so what are the first things we do with the customer is we work out, hey, given your goals, given the constraints and resources you have, which of these three buckets is likely to be the thing that we should start with? Uh, and obviously they, they do different things. So search content, probably where most companies start, that's how you build this kind of compounding organic growth engine publish a blog post and if you do it well you get more and more traffic from that each month with the same fixed cost like it doesn't cost you any more to get that increasing traffic uh, thought leadership that can be really great for companies that maybe the biggest barrier is not just traffic maybe you you know average contract value is really high and you only need to sell a handful of like widgets each month but the thing you really struggle with is being credible to people having your ideas circulate within the very small network of people that are actually going to buy your product. And thought leadership is great for that. And in some cases, companies already have a bunch of prospects that they're trying to close. Maybe they've got like a big outbound sales motion or they use loads of paid stuff. And content can be a really great tool for expediting that process and helping them close those deals a bit faster, documenting the common like problems or pain points and that kind of thing. So in terms of buckets, like, yeah, those three kind of archetypal definitions, I think that's a really good starting point for this conversation. Definitely. And, and we can go so much deeper, like within different channels, you can have different content buckets for topics. You can have buckets for formats. So there, there's a lot that we can go into here. But we'll start there with more major types of buckets. And, and I'm curious already going now we're looking into content buckets when you've seen this for different companies or people that you've worked with what are some of the big mistakes that people are already making right off the jump like beyond just not having content buckets ready to go or, or usable but are there any other big mistakes that you're seeing out there with people developing these or not executing on them i think probably the biggest is just defaulting to seo content um I know certainly when I was younger, in my head, content marketing was SEO because most of the stuff that people write, you do it because you are writing about a keyword. Um, and actually, if you're a very small company and depending on the business model you have, that can be a really, really dangerous waste of resources. Some companies come to us and you know maybe their domain authority is so low that they can pump all the money in the world into writing good search content and they just won't rank for any of those articles. So going back to that idea of like the Maslow's hierarchy or whatever, it's a good idea in the future maybe to write a bunch of search content. But the very first thing you've got to do is build up that domain authority, create content to build the links you need to be able to contest those keywords. Uh, and that is going to be a different type of content to search because like how many people link to, you know, the what is or how to article you've written. It's not the right type of content for generating discussion and debate and that kind of thing. Um, I think probably another like classic one is just not sticking with stuff long enough. It's kind of the, everyone in content marketing always talks about that. It does take a long time to work. Uh, and it does. There are ways you can expedite getting like some visible results from content, but it really is one of those things where the longer you do it, the more consistently you do it, the more content you amass and publish, the greater the likelihood of it succeeding as well. How do you feel about people that try to add in another bucket there for going for virality, basically? So beyond SEO efforts, sales enablement, there's a, a big push, especially in the startup community, right? Where it's like scale up, grow fast. With companies like that, 
they just say, oh, well, we need to go viral without understanding what that really takes. Or how do you think about people that try to put that into a bucket? Does that ever work? It does. But obviously, the problem there is the predictability of it. Um, and actually, when I joined Animals, we basically did no search content. This was like four and a half, five years ago. And it was basically content that was optimized for virality. It was like thought leadership stuff, things that would um, destined for like Hacker News and Twitter and those kinds of communities. And what we'd see is we'd have a handful of articles which would absolutely blow up. And the customers that were kind of lucky enough to see that success were delighted with us. And, you know, we'd buy a lot of goodwill to let us keep writing stuff and eventually have enough swings that we would get a few more articles and start building like a returning user base. But there were plenty of situations where we'd write that content and literally nothing would happen. And you've ended up spending a bunch of money out of pocket for stuff that just hasn't had the intended impact. So I think it's really worthwhile, but maybe the variable is like how much you're willing to spend on it. If you can do it yourself quite cheaply, then by all means, take as many swings as you need to. But if you're paying like an agency or someone else like that, um, it, the unit economics are a bit harder to justify all of those like mishits. Oh, definitely. And I, and I know something about taking a lot of shots and <laughs> having miss hits. So that, that definitely happens as part of the process. And even that, that happens with SEO content too, right? Like not everything you write for SEO is going to do exactly what you think it's going to do. Sometimes it won't perform as well. Sometimes it's going to overperform. So you have to kind of build that into it, which is the name of the game in content. Um, we've talked a lot about companies, content buckets for companies. So more of a B2B focus, but there, there are also creators listening to this podcast that are like trying to build their own personal brand, trying to use content for that. I am curious to hear your thoughts on for, for those people, what kind of content buckets they might be starting out with or how they should start thinking about this concept. If they're just starting building a personal brand, for example. Ooh, good question. I've been thinking about that myself because I'm kind of in the nascent stages of that journey as well. I think a really good starting point is kind of introspection and working out like what is it that I uniquely can share that other people can't share. Um, it One of those things where a lot of people feel like they're imposters, they have nothing worthwhile to share. But the reality is, uh, by virtue of all the experiences we've had in our life, the things we've done at work or in personal life or whatever, we all have stuff that is useful to other people. So having some kind of like filtering system to divide that up into a stream of like content you can create consistently, hugely useful. Um, one of the obvious ways to think about that is we talk about it as a meta content. So you know, the process of actually creating content is itself an interesting thing to do. And this is where you get all these people that build in public. There's this whole movement around building in public. So obviously that's kind of separate from the actual thing they're building, like whatever product or industry they're in, but they have this entire stream of content, which is them talking about the process of building it. And if you're being a bit cynical, you know, maybe there's this kind of like uh, circular self-referential thing going on where you can you know, become a course creator that talks about how successful you are, but you're only ever referencing the act of building the course and there's no like external value to it. But actually, in some cases, it is hugely useful to get a glimpse inside the mind of somebody that is trying to build a new thing and all the problems and challenges they're facing along the way. Uh, it's something I think you've done really well over the years as well, actually. <laughs> No, I appreciate that. Yeah, it's that that, that meta content, the building of public is it is a separate total bucket. And it, it does take a lot of effort to both document and create at the same time, for sure. So when you start adding these things together, it could it could quickly become probably too much. You had mentioned when you do onboarding, you kind of look at three potentials. Maybe you pick one to actually set the goal and go after it and try to crush it. And and then you have your other two that you could always expand to. You've already listed that out. It's clearly important. But over time with companies, I'm sure you've seen, all right, well, now we can add this type of thing. Like we can do an, uh, an interview series on LinkedIn. Now we can add a podcast. Now we can add this, 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 and this. And then you've got eight buckets. At what point does do, do the content buckets become too much or how many content buckets is too many to execute on at the same time? I, uh, I've written an article in the past about this idea of having like a diversified portfolio of content. Like if you're going to you know, invest in the, in anything, you're going to take a few risky bets and you're going to have something that's maybe a bit more stable. And the idea being that obviously if one's really risky and it just totally loses all your money, you've still got, you can save face through the less volatile asset. Um, 
I think if you're a big company or like an established organization, you can afford to do that. You can have like maybe your core SEO content and you'll have some thought leadership that's a bit riskier and doesn't matter if that doesn't pay off or doesn't go viral because you've got the other one to counter it. But I think you're right. The inverse of that is if you're a small company, if you're an individual person, that's probably in the same way that uh, if you're a small investor, you're going to be better served by probably picking one thing picking it as best you possibly can and sticking it out for a minimum term to work out whether it's actually working or not. Because I think going back to like the problems I've seen, being distracted, being dissuaded, going after the next shiny thing before the other thing has had a chance to work is another really common problem. So yeah, I think basically stick with one thing until either you see results from it or you're so utterly disheartened and broken by it not working that you will try something else and maybe try to avoid layering in too many things before you've got a couple that work really, really solidly. Yeah, you, you had mentioned in there the this concept of like testing something out until it works or until it clearly is move onable. I, I guess that's not really a word, but we'll say. Um, so when when you're at that, stage where you're testing new things, maybe you could talk through for the different types of content buckets, like SEO is going to be different than sales enablement, et cetera. But for the different types of buckets, how long should we be putting into it? Because one of the key lessons that you're going to learn from anybody that creates content and even especially those that actually do it well, they're always going to tell you that consistency is the most important thing. The people that stick to it and actually write, record, um, make videos on a regular basis for a long time. Those are the people that usually win. But how how long do we give it until we decide, no, I should probably quit and maybe talk through indicators of, if that's the case? Yeah, love that. Um, maybe I'll just take those three buckets like one by one. Um, so search, obviously, that's the classic like long term play. But we, you know, as an agency, we have this constant friction where companies are paying us every month for content. And the idea that, hey, you'll get a return from this six months from now is kind of appalling and they're not happy to settle for that. So a lot of what we do is trying to find those early signifiers of success to at least know that we're going in the right direction. Um, so obviously the obvious stuff is, hey, our traffic has gone up month over month for like six months and it's way better than it used to be. And that's great. And you know, we started getting revenue that's attributable to this content. But even way before that, um, one of the early indicators I used to talk a lot about with customers was uh, just total number of keyword rankings, because that in itself is something of a vanity metric, like they're not going to result in new business. But there's this useful framing where like every keyword you rank for is basically like adding a new door onto the building of your startup that provides an entry mechanism for somebody now or in the future. So actually, those keyword rankings generally do increase far faster than the actual traffic and obviously the sales will result from that content. So that as like an early indicator is great. And you can quite often see that happen within like a month, two months, um, depending on like the domain authority. Um, something like sales enablement, that should be like a very, very immediate feedback loop. Because the whole point of that is you're basically injecting content into the last stage of the sales process. Um, and you should be feeling that straight away because these are people that are on the cusp of closing. So that should make deals a little bit faster. Your salespeople should be singing your praises from the rafters because you've made their life so much easier and they have this whole library of amazing stuff to talk about. Um, and that's generally like a really easy sale, a really easy way of, it's content that is very clearly working. But the flip side of that is it does nothing to generate new business. So, you know, pros and cons there. Um, and thought leadership is always a kind of interesting one. You know, if you're spending a bunch of time talking about these big high level ideas about your industry, the kind of complaint there is that, oh, it's not resulting in business. We can't see that. It's hard to attribute that. And that's the thing that people usually give up on very quickly. Um, obviously, at Animals, we have firsthand experience of that because that's all we do for our own marketing. And a lot of the things we used to track to know it was working were things like sales conversations is our content being referenced in the conversations we have with prospects? Um, is it circulating amongst our target customers? Do we, you know, we follow a bunch of people that we aspire to work with, like CMOs and all sorts of startups, seeing them share our content or even use some of the terminology we've talked about in our articles. That may not be dollars in our pocket, but that is proof that it's working. Um, and that, 
it's a bit of a slow burner in some cases, but you can see like some qualitative signs of that very quickly. If you, you know, distribute your content to a, a newsletter of relevant people, find a community where these people hang out. Yeah. And, and it's, it's important because I, I want to talk about the flip side of it, the problems of success here as well. We just talked through if, if the bucket doesn't work, how do you know, how can you move on from it? But there could be buckets that just really perform well for you. But there also is kind of a built-in problem there that a lot of people see, which is if you're using the same content bucket for a really long time and it's it's working, you may still feel like you're reaching the same audience over and over. You're not reaching a new audience through that format, through that bucket, through that topic, whatever, however you're organizing it. So if you were thinking through that, trying to talk through a client or or somebody trying to build their personal brand and they brought that problem to you, how would you try to optimize for still using the bucket, but maybe trying to reach a new audience with it if that was a concern? I totally relate to that, actually, because um, I do most of the marketing for animals. And one of the things I've observed over the years is that the people that are most vocal in terms of supporting and amplifying the content we publish are actually not the people that come and work with us there and make us not our target audience. Um, so I write loads of stuff about content marketing, about SEO, and generally it's other content marketers, my peers that talk about this and share it and love it. But by definition, they're also the people that are really good at content marketing, that have their own content teams. And in some cases they, yeah, they're not gonna need our help. So we have this kind of like silent iceberg audience we're trying to reach of like founders and executives, people that are not as vocal about this content. You're not going to see them share it on Twitter because they don't have a Twitter presence. And we actually really should be optimizing for them. So I think maybe the first part of that is just having a kind of moment of honest introspection and saying like, in terms of like who we need to reach for continued business growth, is this content still serving that purpose? Even if it's generating a bunch of traffic and backlinks and people love it, it's still possibly not serving the thing you need it to serve, which is reaching that people. And in those cases, I think keep doing it because there's always a benefit to like brand awareness and backlink generation, that kind of thing. But you just have to carve out like 20, 30% of your resource and focus on content that is going to feel less good, but it's probably more useful in terms of actually reaching that audience. Yeah, you mentioned HubSpot a little bit earlier. You, you like, like many of us looked at HubSpot and you're like, oh, cool. So you can just grow a whole business through content. They've kind of set out the blueprint, but you could also look at HubSpot and be super overwhelmed by everything that they do and think, oh, there's no chance I could ever do all this stuff because they have every channel, every format, every topic known to man under marketing, content, anything. It's all covered. So it's it's a lot. And I'm, I'm wondering for taking it back to first principles, if you were personally, I, I, I think you're actually going through this process kind of now, you, you referenced this earlier, but personally going through the process of trying to figure out your content buckets. How would you try to avoid that overwhelm? What what simple steps would you take first to build your own process and build your own content buckets out? I love that you brought up HubSpot again, just because um, one of the articles I've written, which is probably the best thing I've written actually, was about HubSpot and about the idea that a lot of us look to HubSpot as the archetypal content success story, and it's really useful and we should emulate them. But the reality is the HubSpot we should be emulating is the HubSpot of 10 years ago, before they were this huge industry behemoth with like all these people writing and all this brand awareness. Because if we just try and do what they're going to do, yeah, you can't do that with a team of one. You can't do that with a team of 10. Probably can't do it with a team of 100. So that's just the wrong type of uh, model of inspiration. So maybe a good way of getting started is actually following people that are in a similar phase of growth to you that have similar goals to you as well, whether that's you personally or you as a brand. Um, I follow a bunch of creators on Twitter that are a bit further ahead in the journey of like where I want to go maybe. Um, and the stuff they share is always relevant and interesting to you because um, you can emulate it. You have the same resources, you have the same goals as them. Um, I think another part of it as well is actually what is going to be sustainable for you to create? Um, this was something I just was not good at when I was younger. I would see an opportunity for something and I would throw myself at it because the opportunity seemed good and I'd hate doing it. It'd be the worst thing in the world and I'd have no love for it whatsoever. Um, so I've seen a few people talk about this idea of um, product maker fit instead of product product market fit. The idea being that it has to be a fit for you and your inclinations and your ability to keep doing it time after time. And that's why I use Twitter because 
I enjoy Twitter. It doesn't feel like a chore um, sharing content through that mechanism. So for you personally right now, um, what, what, what buckets would you build for yourself that you'd actually enjoy using for you personally? Well, I'm very lucky that um, obviously I write a lot for animals um, and that is that serves the animal's brand. That's the whole point of it. But there is obviously the serendipitous relationship there where I'm the one writing it. I'm very privileged of like all the people in the team in most cases, it's my face on that stuff. So that is wonderful because it grows animals and I have had the benefit of also growing like my personal brand on the back of that as well. I always think of that as like, that's the core. If I'm going to do one thing, if I'm going to do one thing well and throw my energy into it, it's going to be that long form um, kind of deep dive into our industry, trying to help other people level up their game and um, reflect on a lot of the learnings and processes we do at Animals. Um, I then think of like, I like sharing shorter form, kind of pithier, less developed stuff um, on social media and on my own blog as well. I basically realized I didn't have a space for sharing dumb stuff, stuff that wasn't like 3000 words and took, you know, two months to write. Sometimes you just have a quick idea that can still be useful to someone. I didn't have an avenue for that. So now I publish that on my blog uh, and on social as well. Um, and the thing I'm really bad at, and I probably should add into my like content buckets, but don't, is that meta content. I just, I'm the kind of person that likes sharing the finished thing. I don't like bringing people on the journey. I find it very awkward and hard like, yeah, to do sometimes that. Sometimes it can feel a little bit forced. Like you're very aware that you're on camera or, or writing about your process while you're doing it, and it comes across as less genuine. That's a, that's a hard balance. So it sounds like for you, a lot of it's been more long form buckets. That's, that's been the key focus, which kind of begs the question for me of how would you think about micro content buckets there? If you're, if you're writing something that's longer, um, how quickly would you just get to a place where you're like, I need to figure out a way to distribute clips of this and, and make this more distributable than just this one piece. Have you thought through that much? Yeah, I think there's a kind of like virtuous feedback loop you can create. So one way of looking at it is obviously you make a big thing and then you can repurpose that into like lots of individual snippets. And, you know, what are the like five core ideas you can tease out and turn into like a tweet storm or a LinkedIn post or whatever. But I think the inverse of that is potentially even more useful. Um, one of the things I found my writing over the years is that you look back on the things that you've written, like the short little ideas and pithy snapshots and stuff, and you realize there's a bigger theme lurking behind them. Um, that's actually, funny enough, how I wrote my book in the first place. The idea of writing a book was terrifying. Like, where do you even begin with that? So I just started writing short stories, literally like one little tiny story and then another one, all self-contained. And you look back and you realize, oh, there's... It's written about like the same world, the same themes, the same characters seem to have cropped up behind it. And you realize your brain has been percolating on these bigger things throughout that process. Um, and it's true with like the animals blog as well. I share lots of like little observations that I'll then collect together and that will become the long form thing. So yeah, having some mechanism for like just sharing and capturing ideas and then reflecting back on them and working out what are the commonalities between this that I can stitch together into something more interesting. I, I have lots bigger. of thoughts on this. Twitter is a great place for creating the micro content first and getting it validated so that you can then feel pretty good about your investment into a longer form piece after that. So I've definitely used the inverse of this like you're talking about as well. And on a, on a secondary point, that is kind of how a lot of books are written, especially business books nowadays. Uh, the book Atomic Habits is just a bunch of blog articles that James Clear put together into the most successful book of our generation now. So there, that's a super viable strategy. That's not to say that you could just collect thoughts and turn it into a New York Times bestseller guaranteed, but there's, there is a lot of value in the inverse there as well. I think with, with Gary V teaching us so much about micro content and like distributing longer form stuff into smaller form content, now the flip side has become equally or more so valuable and it doesn't get preached as much but i love that you brought this up i think probably fundamentally it's like uh, a risk minimization process you know you can kind of quietly work on your magnum opus for like five years this amazing book or article and there's a good chance that people just won't care about it because you have no feedback loop you've got no mechanism for getting people excited about it before it's ready. But obviously what you're talking about there, you know, sharing a bunch of blog posts and then choosing the ones that work best and refining that into like some bigger book. 
not only do you have confidence that's going to be popular because you've seen it be popular, um, something other else and poignant as well as a follow up. <laughs> I, I, well, following up there too, like I can see how with SEO content, the, you could get a pretty good feedback loop going and, and reverse that into good SEO content. You could get, you could do that for thought leadership to a certain extent. If you find viral tweets working for you or with a common theme, maybe there is some thought leadership stuff that can go there. But the one that's tricky that I'm trying to figure out how to crack is like sales content. So for sales content, usually it's like you identify a need as a team. We need this case study or we need a one pager or a comparison on this because we're just missing it. But proactively, can you think of any ways where you could actually try to use smaller content to come up with a bigger idea for sales content that's actually viable? I think, um, so Jimmy Daly, who was our director of marketing at Animals before I was doing it, um, he was really interesting because he was both our head of marketing and our head of sales. So literally all of the content he ever wrote, every idea he ever shared basically came from talking to prospects. Um, so he was basically like mainlining this kind of sales feedback every single day. Um, and obviously it's a really hard thing to do to do both of those well. It's amazing that he did. Um, but it basically meant that every idea, every thought, every way he approached like growth and content and animals was just infused with what do prospects and customers care about? What are the questions they're asking every day? What are the concerns they have? Um, so yeah, in terms of like, you could basically just solve individual questions that people have or share observations that you see crop up between five different sales calls, like sharing those commonalities, the problems that your industry is wrestling with. That's really interesting stuff to share. And that stuff that then can be built out into bigger assets at some point as well. Yeah, there's, there's a lot we could bake into these content buckets now that we've been talking about it a little bit more. It's, it's not just, all right, let's build another case study. That's there's, there's a lot more that should be going into this both, creating micro content to lead to bigger stuff, but then reversing that as well. You mentioned that it's kind of risk mitigation. I totally agree. If you've got everything working in loops around each other and it's all just circulating, you're going to have ideas and new stuff's going to come out of that. And you can keep being more proactive than reactive, which is a common theme. Like when I've had struggles in content marketing, it's mostly because I feel like we're in a place of reaction with everything that we're doing. Our strategy is just reactive to our competitors having more followers than us or reactive to feeling like we're missing certain content, but not creating stuff that we actively want to. And when you're able to flip the script and make it all about, here's exactly what we want to do. Let's go out and do it as opposed to here's everything we're missing. Let's get caught up. I think that mindset shift, especially for content buckets is super valuable. I think um, that's one of the things I've loved about working at animals actually, because um, it's been very cathartic because they're basically the company was growing really well without any marketing. And Walter, who's now our chairman, basically said to Jimmy, you know, just write about whatever you want to write, document everything you know about content. They didn't care about keywords. They didn't have much in the way of like a go to market strategy. They just wrote the stuff that was interesting, that they thought was helpful, the like observations and processes they were building as a team. Um, and not only is that incredibly liberating as a creator because you're just writing about the stuff that you think is cool and interesting, it also was a massive differentiator because everyone else was writing about the same tired SEO content and, you know, 20 content marketing tool roundups and all that kind of thing. So not only was it fun, it actually worked really, really well and has become like what Animals is known for today. So I think those two can go hand in hand as well. For sure, yeah. Well, an another thing I wanted to chat through is like, the, the idea of flexibility in this stuff. Cause when you're building out a content strategy, there are certain things you just, you really want to do. You have to do. They're non-negotiable. And if you stack a lot of those things on top of each other, I think this is pretty common. You come up with this really rigid plan strategy that you execute on and it doesn't leave a ton of room for flexibility, whether that's flexibility for trends or for announcements or new things. And I'm just curious how you think through that. If do you, do you stick to a really rigid system and find that that's the most productive once you've found something that works or do you try to keep it really fluid? There's kind of like the content, the constant friction, isn't it? In the sense that 
dates and publishing frequencies are basically arbitrary. As I was saying earlier, like people don't read your blog like they read a magazine, whether you're an individual or a company. But the inverse of that is generally the more you publish, the more consistently you publish, the greater the chance you're going to have some measure of success. So I think it's good to have like a target cadence in mind. Uh, I would never ever go as far as, you know, this has to go out on Tuesday. I think that's probably like a level of rigidity which becomes unhelpful and it stops you having those bigger, more interesting ideas. Um, one of the things we actually did ourselves, we ran a little experiment, which was what happens if we stopped publishing every week and we spend more time on like bigger article ideas. And we found that those bigger ideas would generally much, much better received because we spent more time on the like creative process behind it. We were more excited about it. We were willing to put more time into the distribution and maybe our audience was a bit less, you know, saturated with animals content coming down the pipeline. So I think being as consistent as you can while not losing sight of the fact that you want to share stuff that's good and interesting and trying to publish five articles a week or whatever is actually sometimes a hindrance to that and it can make your content much, much worse as a result. Yeah, def I definitely agree. The, er, most things are arbitrary, uh, especially in, in marketing. And it's it's all about ensuring quality of content. I think that's that's for sure. One thing that I... I'm curious to hear your thoughts about is more incorporating the marketing funnel into the, I, I, now, first off, do you believe in the marketing funnel? I should ask that because that's, that's not something that's widely accepted by everybody, but do you use the funnel framework of marketing for your content? I'm a bit of a skeptic of it in the sense that I think it's a, the, you know, tofu, mofu, bofu, this like linear journey that people go through. I think that's a really useful way of thinking about it. If you are a big enterprise company and you're working with like big years long buying processes with lots of stakeholders that they actually, maybe they do need case studies and you do have to convince 10 people and you know, all that kind of thing. But beyond that, for most companies, I, that rigidity, again, I don't think is a helpful thing. I think it dissuades people from creating stuff that's interesting. The idea that you have to have tofu and mofu and bofu is wrong. Like if you look at our blog, if you look at most of our customers, you can't easily group content into those buckets. It's not a useful exercise to do. Um, yeah, I've seen, uh, I think was it uh, Ashley Faust, someone I follow. Um, she talks about the idea of like a content playground. Basically, people will go through that buying journey, but it's not going to be in that linear, rigid way you expect it to be. Some people will find you through one article and buy immediately. Other people will be your biggest fans and they'll read thousands of your articles and they'll never spend a penny with you. Um, I think the more important thing is to have content that does fit across all of those stages, but the idea that people are going to engage with it in a linear way is just totally not a reflection of yeah, reality. Yeah, so that, that was going to be my follow-up is kind of how you, how you think through it because it's not as, especially with content where not everything is directly attributable. It can become a little bit messy. We know it's worthwhile, but it's not like ads where you can measure every everything. It's it's a bit di more difficult. So what kind of stages do you look at? If I totally agree, like tofu, mofu, bofu, it's nice to think through. It's probably not reality. It's probably a lot closer to a million random actions that then coalesce into something, hopefully, where they buy. But what, what kind of stages generally would you look at for animals, for example, that are actually reality for you? Maybe, a, I don't know, a slightly more useful way of thinking about this is like how integral your product is to the content you're creating. Because um, one of the classic challenges of content marketing, you know, I've written loads of articles in the past where I get to the end and I think, ah, I haven't actually mentioned the product they're meant to be selling. And there's this huge disconnect between the two and it's like never going to serve a business objective. A better way of thinking about it is just having content that in some way relates back to the product. You can have stuff that maybe only vaguely relates to the product. And then you can have things which are bona fide product case studies. As long as you have content that spans that entire like spectrum, I think you've made a very viable way for people to go from like never hearing of you and your product or understanding what it does to actually buying it. Because um, I, I love the example of like uh, Ahrefs, you know, the SEO tool. Their content, in some ways, is the most top of funnel content imaginable. They're writing about these really big sh or short tail keywords, like how to you know acquire a backlink, that kind of thing. But they're also using their product 
as an example in that top of funnel content. So in some ways, it's also bottom of funnel as well. So I think that kind of like that funnel stage thing doesn't hold up. But thinking about it in terms of how easy is it for me to talk about my product in a convincing way in this article, much better, much more useful thing to do. How do you span that line between mentioning the product and showing the product so that it's helpful and then like spamming the content with, with your product. Cause there's, there's a lot of that too, where it, it all becomes very clearly a sales pitch. There, there's a lot of that. How do you avoid it? I think the key thing is just writing about topics where it'd be weird to not mention your product. So again, like using the Hrefs example, um, if they're writing about pretty much any SEO process, it would be kind of weird if they didn't have like a product example because they're this huge SEO toolkit. So whenever they bring it up, it doesn't feel like a sudden bait and switch. They're not going like, here's this amazing advice, by the way, buy from us. It's like a natural extension of the advice they've shared. So it's like, here's a generalizable framework that you read this, you go away, you never think about our product again, you've still got something out of it. But if you do want a next step and like a practical way to apply that, here's how you could do it in our tool. So I think acknowledging that, basically realizing obviously that the reader is not an idiot. They know you have the, the goal of selling stuff to them um, and just making sure that when you do share the product, it's in their interest. To close out here, just a couple of things more that I really want to cover going a little bit beyond the top buckets that we've talked about. So we've talked about more format type buckets, the types of content you want to create down the road, especially for personal brand people, people like trying to create for themselves or smaller companies, they're going to want to use content buckets on a topic level as well. So beyond just knowing, oh, we're going to create sales content, we're going to create SEO content. But within those buckets, having topic buckets that basically say we can speak about this, this, and this, and that's it. So if you were going through that for, for topics of buckets for yourself, what would be your process in collecting the right ideas from the audience, from your audience, whether you have an existing one or not? I've been trying to think about this. I'm actually in the process of trying to build a course, actually, to help people write thought leadership content. And the entire thing you want to do there is basically, in order to write loads of content, you have to have a series of mental models to pull on, to like turn source information into content types. Um, and a few of the buckets there that I think have been really useful and you see people use all the time. Um, one of them is the like counter narrative opinion. So when you see people talking about like the best practices in the industry, all the truisms, the ideas that um, people always believe to be true, if there are examples of that where you disagree, where you know from experience that it doesn't pan out, maybe there's like an edge case where things are a little bit more nuanced than the picture paints, that is a great like use of content. That can be an entire content lane. And that's something we do at Animals a lot. So when do you see people like, yeah, getting the narrative wrong and correcting them through your content? So that's one thing you can do, which I think is really useful. Um, also like, analysis, industry analysis. In whatever industry you're in, whatever field of expertise, you see things happen. Companies getting acquired, new strategies being launched. Um, you are uniquely positioned to add value, to explain and contextualize those events to people that don't have the experience that you have. So that's a really great way of like benefiting from that topical aspect. You know, what is happening now? What is interesting to you? And how can you share this additional layer of context to help other people understand and benefit from it? Another hugely useful thing to do. Um, I think as well, maybe lastly, like personal experiences. This is like the archetypal thought leader thing where you talk about all the money your startup raised or whatever, but there's a whole spectrum of stuff. Um, maybe you solved a hard problem at work that other people don't know how to solve. Sharing that process, giving a little glimpse into that, that's again, that can be a whole content lane for you to write about and talk about all the time. Um, I think the key thing is just, you know, there's no definitive set of content buckets. You just have to have some in your head that you can pull on at any time uh, and use as a prompt for creating stuff. Yeah, the key there is like you mentioned mental models, building out your mental models for how you're going to think through things. It is really unique to the individual if you're talking about sports, like if you're if you're talking about, um, I I don't know the Premier League, and that's what you're really into, it's going to be a lot different than if you're talking about marketing, and probably a lot more exciting to be honest. But <laughs> um, you you have to think through what's going to work for me. How can I? 
And going back to a point you made earlier, what do I want to create on a regular basis? Assuming that I'm going to stick with this for at least a year, what could I definitely create for at least a year every day or every other day? Those, those are pretty helpful mental models to start out with. Um, for you personally, when you're auditing the type of content that you regularly enjoy, what are the common patterns of how they write or what they write about? Do you notice any themes of just people you personally love writing or reading of reading from yeah that's actually very easy to answer and it's basically all the content that absolutely has no hint of marketing about it so i think you know we're marketers we live in this world it's very easy to get quite um like blinded and quite cynical to a lot of the content you create because there's just so much of it out there i'm always really drawn to like the uh individual contributors the like personal blogs of people that have immensely deep expertise in one particular area and spend all of their time thinking really deeply and very nerdily about the stuff they share um, as well as being interesting and sharing ideas that you generally don't find in content marketing proper um, it's also it's much more credible and uh, it has none of the like misaligned incentives you typically see in marketing because they're not trying to sell anything it quite often doesn't look like marketing either. It's all stuff that's written on like blogs that look like they're out of the 1990s because they're you know too busy having good ideas to actually care about what CTA or what color palette they're going to use on the website. Quite often, like all the things we talk about in terms of like brand, they sometimes feel like barriers between you and the reader. It's like it's a reminder that the thing you're reading is a marketing asset and not actually a sincere story or a sincere um, like education point. So anything in that vein, big, nerdy, personal blogs from people that are much better at stuff than I am. I will read that all day, every day. And that's where I get uh, a lot of my like ideas and inspiration from. I love it. Yeah, it's uh, it's hard to be a brand and make content that people actually love. That's a pretty hard thing to pull off. It's a little bit. It's still super hard as an individual, but it's it's easier to pull off with a, a face to put to the name where you feel like it's not just marketing. It's there, there's a little bit more to it, but um, we, we've, we've talked about a lot here. We've, we've gone full circle with content buckets, organization, what makes great content. We've talked about a lot here. My final question really is just at the end of this session, after everything that we've just discussed, is there anything that's still top of mind for you that we didn't cover? I don't think so. Maybe I would just reiterate something that you said actually is a good like way of closing this. Um, whenever you think about content buckets or content strategies, it's very easy to think that there are like Maybe there's five ways to do it and everyone should do it in those five ways. Um, all that is, is just a model. It's just one way of solving this problem of having, you know, infinite content that you can create and, you know, finite problems that you want to solve and reconciling those two things. So I think as long as you have some kind of educated mental model and you have a system through which you can evaluate what you're going to create and how useful it is, that is probably enough. Look to all these like content lanes and templates and formats that people use, but um, don't be afraid to have your own set of heuristics and mental models that you use for your content. It's yeah, probably the most fun way of doing it. One hundred percent, and the most fun way is the way that you probably end up sticking to as well. So I, I love it, Ryan. Again, thanks so much for coming on. Before we hop off here, want to give you a chance to just chat through what you're working on, talk about animals a little bit, and anything else that you want to share with uh with the audience here this the stage is yours oh thank you so um yeah animals actually we've been a little bit quiet on the marketing front but we're stepping things up there um one thing i'm very interested in actually something you know a lot about as well um i'm actually going to launch an experiment where i'm going to try and build an entire blog from scratch using gpt3 um, we've been talking a lot about you know the constraints and limitations of ai and content marketing and how it's not quite at a point to do it on its own two feet. There's lots of human input needed. Um, I kind of want to prove that and actually do it in the real world and see what happens and learn about where humans fit into the process, where AI might replace humans and all that kind of thing. Um, so the next few weeks, we'll be talking a lot more loudly about that. I'm really excited for that. Uh, personally, yeah, I'm chipping away at the third book in my little humble trilogy. That's like my little passion project. Uh, and hopefully in the next few weeks, I'm going to finish this course, which has been hanging over me for months about how to write thought leadership. Um, maybe something that people would find useful as well. And what's, what's your Twitter handle? It is thinking underscore slow. Awesome. Highly recommend. 
Ryan is an excellent resource on content, just a great person as well. So appreciate Ryan Law again. Thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for sharing your, your knowledge with us and spending your time here. And hope to get, hope we chat again soon. There's just so much more to cover with, with content marketing. There's never enough. No, always a pleasure chatting to you. And yeah, I learned a bunch from our conversations as well. Thanks for having me.